Tech News Weekly is sponsored by Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. And by Stitcher Radio. Listen on the go via the Stitcher mobile app. For more information, go to stitcher.com slash gfq. Starting Tech News Weekly in 3, 2, 1... Hey everybody, welcome to Tech News Weekly. I'm Andrew Zarian, and today we have a, uh, a star-studded lineup here on Tech News Weekly. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna first introduce a uh, regular on the show, John, also known as Suncast, is here with us. How you doing, John? It's so weird because like the other day, somebody called me by my nickname and my last name, which I've never really put together. I really thought of my my nickname and then my last name, and it was just so weird having like. Two names with my nickname. Well, you're John like, and you're, not just you're Suncast. Suncast. You, yeah, is see, it? that's weird. Yeah. But then people were saying Suncast Bub, and I'm like, Suncast Bub, that's just weird. You you go by a thousand different aliases on the internet. God <laughs> knows who you are. You're probably all the people, all the trolls that come into the room, too. Probably. I, th- I think you're Joe from Staten Island, and uh, for people who don't know who that is, good for you. <laughs> you shouldn't know who that is. Uh, also here with us, uh, a returning guest on Tech News Weekly, someone that I, I don't know why we don't have you here more often, Michael. Michael Manna from T4Show.com is here with us. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? By the way, I just want to make a quick point. I will counter John's checkered background with my geisha girl background that I have here. <laughs> it's very nice. Uh, one thing to note, I didn't say it off air. This is actually the... Um, the barrier or the border where we put the cat's litter boxes. So a little fun <laughs> fact nobody cares to know. And I bring it downstairs for the show. A little fun fact about Michael. <laughs> yeah. That's your cat's. Uh, I, I am the crazy cat lady. I really am. By the way, cats I, everywhere. Um, Michael posts some great pictures of, of his cats on Instagram and on Facebook. And I, and I stalk those pictures, Michael. Oh, I cra- do too. I, I take them and I stalk them. I it's love it's the great. It's great. My kids. It's so weird. Well, you have a cat too, John. Don't get started, bizarro man. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be a fun show because there's a lot to talk about. It's the end of the year. Uh, tech news kind of slows down at the end of the year, but it seems like the last couple of weeks there there have been some really late breaking news, which is unorthodox for this time period. Generally, December, November, December is a slow kind of everybody's getting settled in, everybody's going on vacation, but it's been kind of crazy with all the news coming out. Uh, I do want to go head first into this. Uh, We've been discussing the Microsoft Surface for a while. Last week, we reported the not-so-great numbers, sale numbers for the Microsoft Surface. Uh, Early this week, we got news that Surface is now headed to non-Microsoft stores. This is something that was a a weird, I guess, bizarre situation between the OEMs and Microsoft, where Microsoft had said, listen, we're going to make our own device, but don't worry. We're only going to sell it in Microsoft stores, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And I want to find out why this is not the case. Is it because the sale numbers were slow? Is it because the OEMs have not produced products that Microsoft feels represents Windows 8? Uh, I'm going to go to you, Michael, first, because you're you're on the Mac side, but you've also had some experience with Windows devices uh, you recently had the Windows uh, Phone 8 device. So what do you think this is? This is interesting to me. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I love Windows Phone 8, by the way, and I love the Nokia Lumia 920. That that operating system is on par with this, if not better in a lot of ways. Uh, the maturity of the App Store is something it suffers from, uh, that the iOS ecosystem completely beats it out. I'll say this about Microsoft it's the age-old uh, problem with Microsoft. The minute you buy Windows 8, they start talking about Windows 9 or 8.5 sure. or whatever. They don't have the focus to concentrate on the products they currently release. In other words, Microsoft Surface RT is, is out, and they're already talking about Microsoft Surface Pro, which is actually going to be, I think, the, the Surface tablet that Windows users are gonna, going to want. The RT is severely hampered limited, uh, confusing, yeah, cumbersome, bulky. I mean, you have Paul on uh, 
on what the tech, and I'm sure he's a Windows guy. He loves Windows, but he can still not recommend or at least fully recommend the Surface RT to his friends and family, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're absolutely right. From it. You're absolutely okay. right. And I think a lot of us had this, uh, much like every other Apple product that comes out, Apple people are responsible too, and I've done it. I've done the same when the new problem, wow, I need to have this. But that really went away quickly with the Surface because it seems like there's an identity crisis with this device. Is it a tablet? Is it a full-fledged desktop? Well, yes, it is. It's it's a it has a desktop UI, but guess what? It's crippled because there's no desktop applications. So it's this bizarre device that it doesn't really know what it wants to be. Now, a lot of that is attributed to the fact that Intel it has been really slow to adapt mobile. Uh, we're waiting for the Cloverfield. Uh, Cloverfield, yeah, yeah, that's it, right? Cloverfield. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's also a movie where a monster attacked New York, but. Uh, th that chipset. <laughs> if that slow. was a Microsoft monster, it would be it would go after New York and then turn around and be confused and <laughs> go back towards Philadelphia, say yeah. I lost my keys in Connecticut, I gotta go back there. <laughs> That's the kind of Cloverfield animal that Microsoft would create. But you know what's funny is, like the, the Surface RT tablet, like you said, if I pick this tablet up. I don't know anything about Intel not catching up. I don't know about this other processor. I come from the world of iOS where I say, okay, when I buy my iPhone or my iPad, I can use iPhone or iPad apps. When I buy my Mac, there's an app store where the Mac apps yeah. work and are already compatible. With the RT, you're like, oh, I just cross my fingers and hope for the best. Well, I think the problem, get the, with RT, the problem with RT for me is that I don't think the people purchasing it understand what it is. Now, John, we had this discussion early on about the identity of what RT devices. And to me, Microsoft is, sell, is in, putting it into stores for two reasons. One, the OEMs did not step up their game and they've, they've been horrible at this. Two, it's been bad. It's been The sales have been poor for it. And three, uh, they probably want to move the inventory because they're probably going to go away from this RT platform once Intel steps the game up and has really good mobile chips. Well, I think anybody with uh, any technology technology knowledge out there knows by looking at Google that you can't just sell products on your own, your own. You have to sell them to everybody. You have to have a good distribution of your product. You can't just sell it yourself. Google tried that with their their first uh, Nexus phone and that failed horribly and now they sell it with, you know, all the carriers and stuff. You just can't do it on your own. Well, and, wait a minute, that's wait a one minute. reasons why. Didn't they do that with the Nexus 4? Or you said the f the first Nexus. I I'm, I'm sorry. The first Nexus phone. Well, they also did it with the Nexus 4 where it was exclusive online. And they totally botched that too. Yeah, and and that's why I'm saying, like, if you look at the history, it's just not a good idea to sell a product by yourself. You have to sell it in stores. I mean, this is one of those products where, all right, you have Windows 8. Windows 8 in itself is an identity crisis, in my opinion. And, and so you're already taking a product that isn't necessarily great, putting it on these other confusing products that people just generally don't really know what what it is, how how to use it what it's used for, what it's capable of, what apps I can use with it. It's, it's, it's so first generation that uh, selling it on your own and not giving people a chance to even try it out in person, unless they're able to access one of the few Microsoft stores that actually exist, well, then, of course, it's going to be a failure. Well, how about this, though? I mean, you said something interesting. It's a first generation device. Should we cut it some slack because of that, Michael? Uh, I don't think we need to cut anybody any slack in this economy right now. You need your dollar means more than ever. And when you talk about a tablet like the uh, the Surface RT uh, being just as expensive and in some ways more expensive than the iPad and the iPad mini. And then you talk about Nexus 7s, Kindle Fires, which are so much more cheaper and more useful than the Surface RT. I, I don't think so. I think what they did was they threw it out there. They expect us to be apologists, if not the same thing as you do with a lot of different technology is you be the guinea pigs, like John said, and we'll turn around in a few months and maybe give you some of what you want and then yeah. give you a little bit more and a little bit more. I think the consumers, and I'm one person, we'll talk about it later, I'm reversing that trend of buying the latest and greatest, and it's part of my job to review this stuff, and I'm holding back. And I think, I think this is what's happened. It's almost become this this illness that we all have and because we're, we're, we're tech geeks and we like this stuff and we buy it, but we buy it going in there 
blindly and we're like, we're just going to buy it. And then we, we hate the device if it's bad. So maybe you're right. Maybe we should be waiting till the second gen device until something comes ar- along that has all the features that we want. I'm going to give you a perfect example of what w- phasing things out. Microsoft announced yesterday that they're phasing Live Mesh out. And when Live Mesh debuted in 2008, it was it was kind of implied that it was going to be a cloud operating system. If you guys remember this, they had they had ha- they had apps, they had development tools. It was going to be all your stuff on the cloud, and that fell apart. It just ended up becoming you know they had Live Sync. Uh, they had sync, which was live mesh, and the thing, you know, totally fell apart. And they finally killed it. It's almost the same thing that Google does that we blame Google for. You put out all these products at the same time. You're, you're taking a huge risk on them, and then you kill it out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it's interesting that they're killing this now. Um, I'm surprised they waited so long, but it seems like they're they're cleaning up house, and a lot of these services that are no longer in use are kind of going away. We saw that change with Hotmail. We saw that change with SkyDrive where they've consolidated a lot of this. So I think a lot of these companies are now in this process where, okay, you know, let's put everything under one umbrella. And Live Mesh is a perfect example that they're killing. Did you ever I use don't it? Understand why, I don't understand why people are still using Live Mesh. I, I, mean, I didn't even know it still existed. I thought that was dead long ago. I think it died long ago, but they <laughs> they still had it. Microsoft never really. What's that? Sorry, sorry. I was going to say real quick. This is the problem with that. We forgot it existed because Microsoft wouldn't support it because they forgot it yeah. existed. That's their thing. Uh, we go to Windows Phone for a second. When the Lumia 900 came out, which I was very tempted by, they said, yes, this will get the upgrade to Windows Phone 8, which is coming in the fall. And then they rescinded that. It's like a bunch of kids in a classroom with ADD, and they're saying, well, make some software, make some hardware, do this, do that, and they just don't know what they're doing. Well, isn't that, what, crazy. Isn't that what Google does on a regular basis? It's a yeah. d- different. Google's got a little more of identity with their cloud services and their advertising. I think Microsoft has completely tried to build an identity and then kind of gets bored with the identity, then tries another identity and over... And repeat and repeat and repeat. I don't know if you guys well, agree like, or disagree, but you know what Google is. You know what Apple is. I don't know what Microsoft is anymore. Yeah. How I, many times did they they change the name for Windows Live? <laughs> what was it? Li- Windows Live Messenger, Windows Live, MSN. Well, they had they had several products under the Windows Live banner, but then they changed the Windows Live name like several times to try and encompass stuff. But they had products that. That kind of fit under that umbrella, but really weren't called Windows Live apps, and it, it was just part of the problem is that Microsoft is really ineffective at communicating uh, what the products are and how to use them. Yeah, yeah and, and you know what? The funny part is that costs money, John and, and Andrew. That costs money every time they come out with the Windows Live Mesh, and they come out. That's marketing, advertising. They're spending how many tens or I don't know hundreds of millions of dollars on Windows Phone Eight or Windows Eight. And they're already kind of putting it out there that they're going to update it, you know, probably sooner rather than later. That's that's wasted money. Yeah, it's it's totally wasted money, and it was hundreds of millions of dollars because I know someone that brokered that deal with that ad agency uh, here in New York, and they had a huge thing here in New York about Windows Eight, and nobody understood it. Nobody understood they what they don't. were exactly getting. And I'll tell you what the problem with Windows Eight was. The perfect example is they really pushed Metro, right? The new modern UI that they call uh, Metro. I love the fact that everybody still calls it Metro and not modern UI. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I refer to it as Metro because I think a lot of people understand what I'm saying when I, when I say it's the Metro UI. But exactly. the reality is you're not really going to be in that Metro UI that often unless that's all you do is, is you download those apps. If you, you've been using Windows for a long time, guess what? You're in the traditional desktop and they did not push that. So that actually scared a lot of enterprise users and a lot of Absolutely. corporate users and a lot of people that use you know, on a or their power users to go. Well, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to go to this thing. I don't want a tablet. I want Windows. But it wasn't only that. It was the fact that people that even followed the development of Windows say they Microsoft pushed this whole Metro idea so much that in, in order to even if you were interested in all, only desktop stuff, you still had to mess around with the Metro stuff. And, yeah. and people that were interested in in just the desktop only stuff. They don't want anything to do with Metro. They and Microsoft didn't have any way for them to just completely bypass that. You can do that with like third-party applications, 
but Microsoft does not give you that option. Yeah. I want to add one more thing to that too. When I watch when I watched What the Tech, I don't know which episode, maybe two episodes ago, uh, with Paul Thorat talking about Sanofsky before they got rid of him and the way Microsoft operates with people like Paul and uh, Mary Jo Foley, other people that constructively try to help the company make a better product, they block them out. They don't said they don't want outside criticism it's almost like the emperor has no you know has no clothes mm -hmm. they don't want to know <laughs> well, yeah. what's going on yeah. outside of their yes men it, it, it's fascinating to me i mean it, it's just actually amazing and uh i'm curious on how this is gonna fall over the entire year uh you know <laughs> i'm really curious what we're going to be saying next week when uh next year this time when windows 8 has matured and it's been adapted adopted more across you know more PCs. So we're going to see what happens with that. This is a fascinating story that came out last week. Um, Tim Cook has been on this media campaign talking about Apple and the future of Apple. And something that he has said is Apple is looking to bring jobs to the United States and looking to manufacture and put together Apple computers here in the United States. They weren't very specific on what computers they're going to bring here. Uh, some people assume that they're probably going to start with a Mac Pro because that's the easiest one to bring here. Uh, and it's the least selling one, so they don't have to do this mass quantity of shipments. Uh, probably a MacBook later on, and eventually they're going to slowly bring them here. Uh, Governor Cuomo did an interview here in New York on AM 1300, and he hinted that Apple has a top secret plan to make future iPhones and iPad chips in New York. Now, New York, New York State was a big chip manufacturing state for a long time. IBM had a factory here. I believe HP had a factory here. And they, they made chipsets. And that's what they did. Intel at one point looking to do some stuff in upstate Intel was, New York as yeah, well. Yeah, Intel was looking to do some chips here in, in upstate New York. But they're saying that uh, it's been pitched, a proposal has been pitched to see a 3.2 million square foot computer chip factory built in the state. Uh, and government Qu Governor Quoto. Quom quota, quota. <laughs> he filled the quota. Governor Cuomo hinted that the proposal might come from Apple. Uh, I think that's a great thing. I think that's amazing. But is it a reality? Is something like that going to happen? Or does it really matter if it's made here? I mean, we, we always talk about bringing the jobs here, bringing the jobs here. But what, first of all, a lot of it are, is robots that produce these things and everything is assembled that way. So how many jobs is it going to actually bring to the States? Um, Michael, where do you see this going with Apple? Do you think this is a realistic thing that they're actually going to bring the assembly and the manufacturing of these chips and the computers here to the U.S. and we're going to see the same prices all across the board? I think the uh, Mac Pro is a safe bet because it's the most premium Apple product that they sell, so they can sell at a high price. Plus, you said the expectations because it's such a niche uh, computer, they don't have to be very high. Uh, yeah, the automation, everybody got all excited saying, hey, it's going to bring so many jobs, or they can even announce it'll bring jobs, and they slowly automate it after that. Uh, I'm a big proponent, too, that if they do bring these jobs back, if they make a MacBook Pro or an iPhone, iPad, whatever they make in the country, I wouldn't mind paying a premium, like a $50 premium or $75 premium, knowing it was made in the USA and that my money is going towards American workers. I think that point should be really... Uh, stressed if it's going to be an actual physical human being making these products. What do you, how about you, John? What do you think of this? Do you think this is realistic that it's going to happen? You know, it's tough because one of the things that, you know, you have to think about when you, you, ha you look at having bringing your manufacturing back here to the United States is that one of the reasons so much stuff was outsourced was because it was just so much cheaper. And while Michael, Michael is saying that he would be fine with paying, you know, a little bit more money for stuff here made in the United States, is that enough of a high premium? I mean, how much is it going to cost for them to actually bring it back here? Because they were saying that, you know, they could possibly offset some of the costs by using automation and robots in order. Because if you look at it now, they're paying probably pennies to these people in China, these poor people that have to put all these products together. And, and so how much more is it going to cost them to actually do this stuff here in the United States? I don't know if you saw that interview he did with NBC uh, where he said that it's not due to the pricing difference. That's not why they they produce them in China is that we're not skilled enough to do what they're doing in China. That's a much bigger problem. I mean, you're talking about 
really big picture issues, both you guys. You're talking about education because we need to educate more people in engineering, science, math, uh, things of that nature. We don't have enough of those people. And also at the same time, corporate taxes, whatever kind of taxes made the corporations go and outsource or go offshore mm -hmm. into China where they have that entire block or city of places where you can just get everything made, one-stop shop type thing. They need to drop a lot of that stuff to bring Apple and Samsung, all these other people back from the other countries and make stuff in the United States. You know what's fascinating? And it's the totally the other side of the argument for, for the automotive industry. We actually don't – there are people that do not buy American cars because they're made here because we don't think we could produce the car. People go and buy Japanese cars made in Japan. People go buy German cars because they feel that it's a better better manufactured and produced vehicle. But mm -hmm. nobody's ever saying that – like I'll give you an example. Um, Kia has a factory here. Kia is a Korean company, and they make the cars here in the United States. Nobody's saying, well, it's costing us more to make these cars here in the States. Good point. Good point. That Hondas argument are does made not here exist. Too. Yeah, Hondas are made in Ohio and I think parts of Connecticut have, have I think some Toyota Hondas. Has some I mean, there's a lot of places that are made over here. What's that? I think uh, Toyota has some stuff in sure. Tennessee. Sure. I mean, mo mostly all Japanese cars, but I went with a Korean car, which is, you know, Korean cars are looked at at a, at a lower quality rate than a Japanese car. So, in reality, does it automatically play Gangnam style? It does. It does actually. As soon as you start the car, <laughs> uh, I, I I was I'm actually surprised that that argument is existing. I don't think the price is going to be a huge offset. I don't think we're going to see this fifty dollar premium, Michael. I think we'll probably see a couple bucks here and there, but they're going to offset the cost somewhere else. Uh, maybe they're going to charge you more for Apple Care. Maybe they're going to give you less Apple Care. Who knows what they'll do with these devices? But. It, it's interesting to see that this is the argument now and this is Apple's and listen, I think this is a big, you know, it's it's an it's a thing for them to sell now with the product. Not only are you getting, you know, what well, our build quality is better, you're getting Apple Care, but now it's made in the States. But that's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a false uh sense of sense of pride for the people buying it. Cause you you're thinking when it says made in the USA, that you're supporting American workers. And if it's completely automated, then they're kind of yeah, you know, a little bit of sleight of hand, a little bit of smoke and mirrors to let you think that, yeah, yeah, I mean, we have a bunch of employees now? and they make a living, make a living off of Apple. Well, well, they do that now. They say it's designed in the United States, but assembled elsewhere. Yeah, and you know what? You <laughs> know what? That, you're absolutely right. And I can tell you, I know a handful of people that have said Apple's made in the United States. It says so in the back of the the iPad or back of the box. And I say no. It says design, not made. So and that's one person, Johnny Ive. He's yeah. getting all the money for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting all the money for it. Uh, Facebook year in review. Uh, Facebook released uh, some of the top events for 2012. There's a whole list there of just, just statistics that they've compiled throughout the year. Yeah. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll go through some of the events. U.S. presidential election, obviously, the Super Bowl, the death of Whitney Houston, uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, the Olympics in London over the summer, the death of uh, Trayvon Martin, which uh, swept all across the social media websites, Facebook IPO, they they released their stock, the Aurora shootings, death of Dick Clark, and Obama endorsing gay marriage as uh, that fits the top three. They also have a list of the top 10 songs, uh, top 10 movies, Hunger Games, Avengers, Magic Mike, The Vow, Twilight, 21 Jump Street, The Dark Knight, Dr. Seuss. I got it problem with how low the dark knight rises was i, I know a real problem with that that's a, that's inaccurate you think so i think so i think because it was so late that a game and the, and the awards hunger games came out earlier than the year yeah that's interesting uh check-ins the most checked in place in uh i guess in the united states is times square new york followed by disneyland yeah. in california interesting disneyland and not disney world huh that's weird yeah. yeah usually more people go to orlando at&t park in california Yankee Stadium in New York, Rangers Ballpark, Fenway Park, Dodger Stadium, Universal Studios in Florida, Wrigley, Wrigley Field, and Angel Stadium in California. So it's mostly New York and California. I can assume I know, that some most of this of these stuff people are using Verizon because the AT and T where you're at these big stadiums and stuff, the AT and T doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're probably Verizon users checking in. <laughs> I don't know that I necessarily. I really agree with a lot of stuff on here. I mean, like television in particular, that's a really weird list. I just, I simply don't understand some of the ones that are on here. 
Um, because he got like Duck Dynasty, Honey Boo Boo, Big Bang Theory, Game of Thrones, Downton Abbey, Breaking Amish, Ink Master, Long Island Medium, Wife Swap, and Two Broke Girls. Like, really, I didn't know Wife Swap was even still on TV. Well, have you have you looked at your Facebook timeline lately, John? No. These are the types of people that, that, that this, these yeah. are the types of people that, that coincide. So that's pretty accurate for a Facebook TV list. These are the people that that would say, "I love those Facebook uh, status updates where people go f this," and then fifteen oh sending hugs. Oh, what's wrong, dear? <laughs> or somebody goes, "Oh, I hate those people." And our people I hate are the people <laughs> that put status updates telling us how tired they are. Well, you weren't tired enough to actually post an update to your Facebook, so shut up. How's that? That's great. Actually. Go watch Duck Dynasty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, that's I mean, actually a really interesting show if you've ever seen it. It's it, awful. That it, oh, come on. come on. It's hilarious. They're so, they're so redneck. Uh, sports, uh, the New York Giants, New England Patriots, Tim Tebow. Uh, what a waste here in New York, by the way. London, uh, 2012 <laughs> Olympics, Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, Denver Broncos, six, uh, 49ers, Eli and Peyton Manning, Jeremy Lin. Number nine, I thought that would have been bigger. And uh, the LA Clippers, uh, the top memes, to be honest, I don't know what that is. I don't know what TBH. Are. Oh, you know what it is? It's like saying YOLO, which you know what? I will punch anybody that says YOLO in front of me. Thank I will just God. hit them right in the face. Uh, Cody, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard is, is this YOLO. What the frick is YOLO? Live, you you only like live once. Every time you say it. Yeah, girls are getting it like tattooed on their knuckles now. It's like a big thing. Uh, Gundam oh, style. Don't regret that. No, no, not when they're forty. And it says yellow on their <laughs> finger. Uh, Cray, another one. Big Bird, Linsanity, SMA, shaking my head. Uh, so these were some of the top. Uh, how is things how in shaking my head a, a meme? I don't understand. I don't know. That. I don't know. I thought people have to been be saying honest, that for how a while. How is that a meme? I see. To me, a meme is like a viral video or something like that, or, or something that that. See, Gangnam Style to me is a meme. Yeah, yeah. Or a viral video. Uh, shaking my head. How is that a meme? I don't know. I still haven't seen that video yet. And anybody that comes up to try to make me, they're automatically my enemy. <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky. You, you're not missing out on a whole lot. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'm totally going to start bribing people to do that to you now. <laughs> you just start paying them to do it? Uh, Shit, just to see what happens. I want to I'll never get to spend the money. I want to go into this next story because this is interesting <laughs> to me. Um, Dropbox is buying Audio Galaxy. Now, this is a name that we have not heard for a long, long time. And Audio Galaxy has been around, I believe, pre-Napster. Mm -hmm. They've been around a really long time. I used to use them, like, years ago. Now, am I, am I, am I remembering this right? Audio Galaxy was the one where you would sign up for a list and you would automatically be sent these MP3s? No, it was like a music stream. It reminded me a lot of Google Music Player in a way. I, I forget how you even got the songs, but it was like a Pandora or something yeah, it was like more that. Like it was Kaza, actually one of, the first, one of the first iPhone apps I reviewed on uh, our YouTube site. And I just remember I really, really liked it. I used it in the gym. And I can't quite even remember the features. It's been that long since I even dealt with it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. How it, How was it, John? Uh, the, I, the I remember initial. it being more Kaza-like. It was like Kaza. Yeah, like you, it, it, it was basically like one of the first peer-to-peer -peer sharing programs that I remember, like modern day peer-to-peer -peer sharing, like you would think with torrents and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, they've become a streaming service over the last couple of years, and now Dropbox is looking to get into the, the music hosting uh, game. And I think that's a great idea because there are many people out there that have Dropbox, and uh, you're kind of limited at the 100, gig the 100 gig mark. And if they have some sort of music service where they, they could host your MP3s, I think that's phenomenal. Well, here's a, here's a point, though, with Dropbox. Obviously, uh, the privacy concerns and the security concerns over the past year or so have come up with your data and with the government. Uh, how's the music, you know, as far as the, are they going to data mine? Are they going to sell what kind of music you listen to? Are there going to be ads in Audio Galaxy? I assume even if you pay for Dropbox, this Audio Galaxy might provide some ads or some data for people to target you. I'm going to the Audio Galaxy website to see what they have there right now. What was it recently that they they announced was now or Instagram? They said and is now going to have ads on it. Facebook said, "Really? Yeah, Facebook. Uh, I think this week or last week said that 
they're going to start introducing advertisements and Instagram now. I mean, listen, they're free services, so they have to make money on it some somehow, right? Unless they offer yeah, premium. Yeah, but it just seems kind of cheap that you would, you would take over a company, you buy it, and then blast it with ads. It, it just yeah. seem, seems like you're you're totally taking advantage of the user base that you bought. Wait a minute. That's all Facebook is. That's all they're about, actually, yeah. is trying to target and data mine <laughs> and do this. You know what's funny about Instagram is that, um, or Twitter, I should say, has Twitter become profitable yet? I'm not too sure. And if they are making a profit, it cannot be a, a pretty large profit. And this is the problem with a lot of these companies. They're relying on venture money. And, you know, eventually um, that money runs out and you have to create some sort of revenue for your company. And how do you do it? How does something like Twitter create revenue? Well, they have the promotion uh, aspect to it where you could promote your tweets. You could uh, they have special pages with major companies like Coca-Cola and they get their tweets promoted. But is that enough? And is it valuable? I don't know, because, you know, Twitter has changed our culture even more so than Facebook to the point of. You don't have Michael.Mana coming up on that lower third. In most cases, you have at Michael Mana, my Twitter handle. The Twitter handle has now become a more identifying feature than your actual name. And that's why is amazing. that? Okay, that's, so, that's the change. Yeah, so okay, so let, let's look at that for a little bit. Why is that valuable? Well, it's valuable because it's not a one-time visit. If you put out your website, the odds are they're going to come there once or twice and not do it. But if they're following you on Twitter... To me, that's more it's of a networking. valuable. It is, and and you know what? Now, now I'm locked into the Michael Mann experience. Whatever Michael Mann is doing, it's in my newsfeed. So every that's time you're point. promoting if they something, they can't monetize it at this point. When will they ever be able to? It's just it's so ingrained in our in our culture. They've changed our lives at, at using Twitter, and Twitter is just like tweets are probably in the dictionary now. The, you know, tweeting and sending a tweet. That's what I mean. If they got gotten that far and they can't monetize it and make a profit, they're never going to, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, John, go into the Sprint story because you follow this stuff a little bit more than I do. Yeah, this is interesting because if you remember, um, I think it was a month or two ago, um, a Japanese carrier by the name of SoftBank decided that they would be interested in and made a, a bid to purchase Sprint, like a 70% stake, and it's like billions of dollars that they're spending to purchase uh, uh, a sprint, and this Japanese carrier, SoftBank, also has a lot of interest in Clearwire. It's it's one of the companies that they use back in Japan to do a lot of their data networks technology with. So now Sprint is actually making a formal offer of two point one billion dollars to fully acquire Clearwire. While right now they have a majority stake in Clearwire, with with SoftBank coming in and taking over, it just makes more sense for Sprint to completely take over. Uh, Clearwire because that's the data technology that they're already familiar with and that it would just make things a lot more easier between SoftBank and Sprint to build out their LTE network that they still don't have yet. Now, now Sprint was really backing WiMAX for a while, right? The WiMAX yeah, technology. Yeah, I think that really didn't pan out. I mean, yeah. well, in large part due to, I think, uh, I forget what the name of the company was. It started with an L, like Leap something. And they just were not a very good company to begin with. Yeah, and they kind of they kind of went towards Clearwire after uh, that kind of fell apart. But uh, I guess this is good for them to build their infrastructure and build their network, which they need to. Absolutely. I mean, this is something that it, it's in the same way as T-Mobile, where the problem is you have AT&T and Verizon, which is, uh, in reality, compared to Sprint and T-Mobile, ahead of the game. Yeah, but they're giants. I mean, that's what's happened. But this this kind of allow Sprint to be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more... Um, Which is something that boys. I believe SoftBank wants to do. Is If you read some of the interviews from the uh, SoftBank CEO when they uh, were acquiring or uh, made the purchase of uh, Sprint, he says that he thinks our data networks here in the United States are so much more slower. And, and it sounds like it's something that he would definitely be interested in doing, which makes complete sense as to why they would want to completely buy out Clearwire. Now, Michael, who's your who's your uh, wireless provider? I have AT and T right now, but I do have the Galaxy Note two from Sprint, and I can back up. The data speeds are the one thing in the covers, of course, but the data speeds more than anything are the Achilles heel. Are the one huge flaw with a device like the Note two, or even if you get the iPhone five uh, from Sprint, you're really sacrificing. Uh, 
I'm thinking about on another note, I'm just thinking about switching from AT&T to straight talk because for 45 bucks a month, I get unlimited everything. I get a few gigs of data that, that I have to stay under, but it's 45 bucks a month. And with some like Sprint, AT&T or any company outside of a prepaid, you're paying all those extra taxes and surcharges. So my girlfriend's bill comes out to like 48 bucks a month prepaid for straight talk using the AT&T towers. And going back to Sprint, they charge a minimum of 90 for these LTE devices per month. I mean, for half the price, you're getting the AT&T network with better data speeds and more coverage. The Sprint really needs to step up their game and become more affordable, in my opinion, as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think they all have to get a little bit more aggressive with the pricing. But uh, last week, we, were, we reported on the story that T-Mobile is looking to totally shake up their entire pricing structure and offer an offset the cost of contracts with a little bit higher of a cost for their products. Oh, okay. I love that. I have the T-Mobile $30 prepaid whenever I need data. And I know I'm going to, I can just pay the 30 bucks. Turns out to be like $32. And I get five gigs of data with 100 minutes. And then I use an app like, uh, say, Talkatone or Magic Jack or something like that with a device. And I pretty much have unlimited minutes and five gigs of data. I mean, that's another attractive thing. I think prepaid is going to be contracts are just such a, excuse my language, just a pain in the ass. And I will never, ever sign another cell phone carrier contract ever in my life you know i have a i have a I have family in europe and i got a, i got a lot of friends in the uk and contracts do exist there but throughout europe they do not welcome these contract plans they're not a big fan of them and a lot of people are just on prepaid phones and in, in a strange way in this country it's looked at as a bad thing if you're on a prepaid plan or you're on a month to month that's because they're used to watching person of interest where everybody has burner phones that are prepaid. and They think you have to be a drug dealer <laughs> or a criminal to have a prepaid phone. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I mean, prepaid plans well, I think are looked part at as of the it best. Too thing. is that a lot of times the, the the devices that you are offered on a prepaid plan kind of suck. Yeah, I think so, that also has a lot to do with it. But it's totally changing, and I think that's great. And I think more competition, the better. Uh, Sprint is kind of stepping up their game here, and uh, I hope so because. I personally have no cell phone service where I am. If I if I go down in my area right here, this this maybe six hundred feet to 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 my left and six hundred feet to my right, I have no service. If I get out of this little bubble that I'm in, four bars, four G access, I'm getting twenty eight megabits per second up and down. But wow. in my house, I get zero. No nothing. Good service. Uh, Verizon, AT and T uh, has. Been great, and they, they they constantly send us phones. And AT and T service was really good. I, I was surprised because I had a bad experience with AT and T years ago. And I spoke to the vice president of, of marketing in this region, uh, and we were talking about it. And he goes, "Well, what's your AT and T experience?" And I go, "Not great." And he goes, "Okay, so we're going to send you a phone. You let us know how it is." And I called him. I'm like, "I'm going to be honest with you. This is really good. The service was phenomenal. So they, they've even upped their game. I don't know what's going on with Verizon here. They're number one in New York, but not number one in my area." Uh, it's really which, weird. It was the opposite. Verizon's great, and at and is usually horrible in the New York area. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, baffling. Now, Michael, I want to talk to you about something before we do our picks of the week, because uh, we had an interesting discussion off the air about uh, the adaption rate of new products and new technology, which we spoke a little bit about early on in the show with the Surface. You've kind of changed your entire outlook on this, and you're not adapting to the latest and the greatest as fast as possible. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's just a, it's not even a, a, an economy thing or a needs thing. It's really just a, the trend of looking at this. And Apple sort of, I guess, woke me up to it. It used to be, I, I used to be the biggest Apple fanboy. I'd, I'd wait in line, always get the greatest Apple products that came out. The greatest is in quote, because that's what they would tell you. Uh, you know, and I used to really be gung ho about that stuff. But ever since they came out with uh, the four, then the four S and a little bit of a bump up here. And then the 4S to the 5, which really didn't do anything except give us LTE and the bigger screen. Uh, them going with the iPad uh, refresh cycle. Colm's in the chat room. He can speak on this. The refresh cycle for Apple, going from way back when we used to get Macs, like two years, every two years, a, a new Mac would come out. Now their upgrade cycle has gone in the exact opposite direction to where the iPad 3 came out in the spring and then they just went end of life after six or seven months, the iPad 4 came out. Now the iPad mini, which doesn't have retina, 
rumors of the iPad mini with Retina coming in uh, the spring of 2000. Do you see where I'm going with yeah, this? Yeah, well, I'll give you a perfect so, example with this. Here's a great thing, and you brought up the mini, and, and uh, I was talking to John about this the other day, how I, I went and I really liked the mini, and I picked it up. I'm like, wow, you know what? This is, this is a, a cool little device. And for $349, I kind of justified the purchase. And I thought about it. I'm like, you know what? They're probably the next generation is going to have Retina, so I'm just going to wait for this. That's the Apple conditioning that we we have kind of known to expect. Well, this one doesn't have the feature that we all want, so the next one will have it. Uh, but I don't think the mainstream knows that. I don't think the mainstream understands that the next one will probably have it. I don't think the mainstream it. knows a lot of things outside of Wife Swap and, uh, and Real duck, Housewife in New Jersey's it, and Duck well, Hunters. The mainstream, should, the mainstream should be even more cautious about spending their money, though. I think even mainstream people, they don't upgrade their phone every six months or a year like we used to with the iPhones and, and even the iPad coming out uh, every year or so. It's, it's completely changed where this 4S, I have a certain... Um, what should I say? I have certain criteria for the upgrade. Now, if they came out with the iPhone 5 and it had a 12 megapixel camera, ooh, that would be, you know, because there's nothing beats this camera. I don't care what you say. The 4S camera. It's phenomenal. I don't know about the 5, but nothing beats this as a point-and-shoot camera on a cell phone. Now, I talked before about never signing a contract. I think the weakness, too, with these iPhones is... I can't walk in like I can with a Lumia 920 or a Galaxy Note 2 and say, I want to buy this phone, no commitment, where I don't extend my contract. A little bit of warning for everybody out there. Even if you're paying $549 or $649 for an iPhone 5 within your contract with AT&T, you renew your contract for another two years. I don't know yeah. why, but that completely turned me off too to try and upgrade. Why is it like that? I don't know. I asked uh, Apple and AT&T about it. They said, it's just something with the iPhone. I guess their agreement is, even if you buy this thing, you have to buy it unlocked, which is, I think, another couple hundred dollar premium on top of that. And they waited. I think it's out now, but they wait yeah. a bit before releasing the unlocked version that you can buy with no commitment. You know, that's why these Craigslist buyers or sellers, I should say, are really jacking the price up because it's really the only way you can be guaranteed not to extend your AT&T or whatever carrier contract with the iPhone 5. Yeah, I mean, the pro the contract stuff is it just ridiculous at this point because you're always going to be locked into it. And it seems like more and more is being taken away from us uh, with the iPhone. It's interesting because if you think about it, this is this is a really interesting discussion in the process of. Well, do you want contract customers or do you just want customers, period? Because a lot of talk right now is about how T-Mobile is losing subscribers and contract customers and how they measure how many people they have based on contracts. So is it more important to have people on contracts or is it more important just to have people overall subscribing to your service? I think for them it's a the contract. They want to see that contract. They want it. They want it. They want it. Um, but now that T-Mobile is is basically doing away with contracts, what what happens now? Because it's just it's it's almost like a game with their statistics, where it's like, all right, well, uh, people, all, all these other companies go off of contracts. How many contracts do they have? So we're just not even going to say that. We're just going to say uh, we're going to do it with contracts and, and tell them that this is how many people we have on our network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, then again, then again, you look game. at it like this. T-Mobile, yeah. I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, T-Mobile may be the most forward-thinking company. Everybody else is so like backward-thinking with those contracts. Maybe if T-Mobile comes out with an ad campaign saying, we don't want you to feel like you're trapped. We want to earn your business every month. We want to make sure, we want you to want to be with T-Mobile, not feel like you are you have to be. Yeah, but and then you know what the downside with T-Mobile is? There's no service. Well, they're working on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean and that that's why they, they have to be competitive. Now, how long is it going to take them to get their act together? I don't know. I don't know two when years. they're going to... Uh, two years. Yeah, I think they said two years. Minimum. Uh, uh, but is that enough time for them? Have we been locked into this Verizon AT&T mindset of this is where you go to get the products, uh, this is where you go to get the latest and the greatest phone? Is that enough for them to you know offer to have I these subscribers the, go I over? think a customer that looks at Verizon and AT&T who isn't grandfathered in the unlimited data might say... I don't want to go to Sprint because I like having the ability to swap out and buy new phones. I know what a SIM card is. I know I want to stay on GSM. It's very attractive to know, okay, I might get throttled after five gigs, but I'm not going to get overcharged for it either. I'm not going to yeah. get charged over this. I'm not going to get shut off. 
uh, and, and I'll have service. That's also an entire track the thing besides no contract. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion uh, to have about this because we were kind of conditioned to think a certain way when it comes to cell phone providers and the way that we do our wireless data plans. Uh, but now we're starting to see a shift. Like one thing that I noticed that everybody's doing, which I think is great, is these family shared data plans where if you have a tablet, you don't have to spend $30 a month, mm -hmm. $40 a month for that tablet anymore. It's only 10 bucks, 10 bucks uh -huh. extra to add it to your plan. And I know in the end, it's kind of, unless you have, you know, two, two phones, you're not really making out. But if you have like four devices on a family plan and you really don't use too much data, you know what? It's not a bad, it's not a bad plan. You know, also you can do now is that instead of just adding that, you could get a Wi-Fi only tablet and then use your mobile sharing that includes hotspot sharing on it now. So you could do a hotspot on your phone and share that with your Wi-Fi only tablet. But the, but the problem with all this is it's certain phones, it's certain devices, it's certain plans that let you do that. It's not all across the board. It is on Verizon. I believe that really? basically any smartphone that is on a mobile share plan has access to a hotspot sharing. I didn't know that. I have access to online now that we have the mobile sharing stuff. My parents have it. Oh, I didn't know that. I had no so clue, actually. And any, any Wi-Fi enabled device I have, like my Kindle Fire, my, my first gen Kindle Fire, if I enable wi uh, the Wi-Fi sharing hotspot stuff on my iPhone, I can connect that to my uh, Wi-Fi only Kindle Fire. Huh. Yeah, here's the problem, though. If you're on an LTE the smartphone, you're going to hit that that cap and those overages yeah. very yeah. quickly. Verizon's very fast. It's well, it's the, the same. It's the same. Even if you add, add add it for ten dollars to your plan, it's it's still going to chew into that whatever you're paying for data. So, like, I pay seventy dollars a month for um, four gigs of data. So it doesn't matter if I add another ten dollars to put a um, a tablet on there. I still have four gigabytes of data to choose from from all my devices yeah but the problem with that is four gigs goes really quickly when you're starting to use it all across your devices yeah you know that that's the issue with that why don't we do i think an interesting point about i think an interesting thing is that at&t has rollover minutes i think they should really make you keep the data you pay for you should have rollover data at this point it should be able to be done yeah because i use like 140 megs a month on my on my data I pay for, I think, four gigs, but I use oh, but 140. That would, just, that would be stealing from them. Oh, yeah. They would yeah. lose money doing yeah. that. Yeah, they, they can't they would. do that. Because we all know every that would, bit. That would, that would make us go broke. I, we, all know, broke we all know that. bits are very expensive these days. It's like diamonds <laughs> and gold. Uh, why don't we do our picks of the week, guys? Every week, um, myself, John, and uh, our guest, which this week is Michael Manna from T4Show.com. Uh, he does a great show every Wednesday at around 2 o'clock, right? Uh, whenever Colm is like getting over his hangover. Yeah, yeah. He whenever he's coherent. I know. He's, yeah, he's... <laughs> we don't offer any kind of wellness policy or rehab with the T4 show, but I'm thinking about just paying for it out of pocket. <laughs> for for him. Yeah. You know, you could send him to, uh, what is that? What is that? Passages Malibu. I hear it's beautiful over there. It's a great, great rehab. No, we're going to send him to the ghetto. To get it. Yeah. He's got a scrub toilet with a toothbrush. Uh, T4show.com <laughs> is Michael's website. Michael, you're also doing some great appearances uh, on almost like every single radio show all across the country. And uh, you're being represented by a pretty good PR group. Um, and, I've, and I've looked into them. They're great. Uh, eclectic Media, right? Yeah, yeah, they've been great. Shannon, Stephanie, and the entire group of Eclectic Media. They're the ones that landed me that deal with Fox and Friends first on Black Friday, which was a really great uh, opportunity. Uh, radio, I do at least one to two radio shows a day. I do some TV appearances like First Business. Uh, it's great, you know, and I, I definitely recommend anybody that's looking to get their name out there to go to them, or even if they want to book, you know, myself or hopefully you in the future, they'll be able to go to Eclectic Media. Yeah, I think I think it's a really cool thing, and and it was amazing to see you on Fox. I mean that that's that's a big that's a big uh, accomplishment, you know. Yeah, everything broke before the segment started. By the way, nothing worked, so they were all flipping out and panicking. And I, I from years and years of getting three percented with everything I buy, I was just I was the most calm one on the set. It's uh, it pretty funny. If it didn't break, I would have said something went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's at that point now. Uh, I so did almost break the camera with the parrot, though. I, I right heard, I heard you yelling at the guy, at the at the co, um, uh, the the I guess the anchor, and you were saying, "Don't make sure you don't break this because this is very expensive." 
Yeah, and I wouldn't let her turn the jam box up. She didn't want to have a dance off. Uh, time for the picks of the week, guys. Uh, every week we pick an item, a tech product, uh, anything we want that we like. And this week, Michael, why don't you go first? Why don't you do us the honor and go first with your pick of the week? Sure. I have it right here. It's attached to my bike helmet. This is called the uh, the freewheeling uh, Bluetooth speaker. There's three parts to it. It's kind of odd. It's a niche item. But if you do a lot of biking like I do, uh, this particular piece of equipment will enable you to have, you know, Bluetooth speakers attached to your bike helmet. But also, you can sync it up to your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac. I've used it as a desktop speaker as well. Uh, and it works perfectly. It's, a, it's great when you're riding your bike out there and you're able to hear music or radio or podcast, but not be vacuumed in, not be isolated from the sounds around you. So it's got a dual benefit for that. It's a little pricey at $150, but if you, you want to use it for your for your desktop and you also do a lot of biking, I think it's, it's an essential Bluetooth um, accessory. Also, you can take phone calls with it too, which is really, really cool. That's really cool. Uh, what What's the site uh, for the product? Oh, richardsolo.com. I'm sorry. Richard Solo, the, the guy uh, used to own Sharper Image. Oh, very so cool. Go, yeah, that guy. So it's richardsolo.com. They got great batteries, great accessories. They got stuff like the Parrot AR drone there. Uh, they have cool watches. You, you'll really like the stuff they have there. I'm going to go check them out. Uh, great pick, Michael. Uh, John, Thanks. what is your pick of the week? All right. As you know, um, I've been on the whole app uh, iOS app kind of kick lately now that I have an iPhone and uh, today and this week is absolutely no exception. I have another iOS application for you this week. It's called App Shopper and this is a pretty cool app because uh, if you're always looking for apps or you're actually trying to get like the best price, you're waiting for discounts, you don't mind waiting a little while to try and get discounts. App Shopper is a great app where you can actually keep an eye on applications and see whenever they get a price discount, a price drop, or whether they get an update and you can keep an eye on it. It'll give you push notifications whenever this stuff happens. So let's say you're interested in buying um, like Twitter, Twitter Riffric. If you want to add that, you say you want it, you check it, and then you can actually follow along with whenever it gets an update or it gets a price drop. It'll send you a push notification as soon as it happens so that you're always up to date and you can actually know if you need to update your application or if it has a price drop and you want to like, decide you finally ha reached a price that you're comfortable with buying this product with, which is pretty cool. But it does a bunch of other stuff. They have a website where you can go to and follow all the stuff. I mean, it kind of goes in tandem with what you have on your iPhone. But the iPhone is just its so super easy to follow along with what's going on. Um, you can see like popular applications, which is separated between paid and free categories, which is really cool. Um, you have a wish list, which is really awesome, so you can keep track of what applications you want. You can see what apps you have, so you can still keep an eye on what applications you have. One of the cool things that, that you can do is you can actually see update and price drop history. So if you look for an app, you can actually see like for the past two years when and if it had a price drop or price increase. So you can see is, is this app that I'm looking at, what's the likelihood of it ever getting a price drop? So you can actually see, you know, when it went on, it had a price drop. So like Camera Plus, I think I was looking at the other day, and like seven months ago, it had a price drop. And I can see that exactly which month it was, which That's is really cool. cool. Yeah, uh, It's a free application. It's in the iOS store. It's awesome. I really like it. It's free. It's cool. It's called Apps. I think it's App Shopper. I always want to say Apps Hopper, but it's App Shopper. Uh, and we're going to have a link on our uh, website at gfknetwork.com. You can also go to uh, appshopper.com if you want. Very cool. Uh, my pick is a um, – it's, it's not a software pick. It's not speakers, uh, but it is um, hardware. Uh, I recently updated the RAM on my – the memory on my MacBook Pro because I had four gigs on here, but I kind of wanted eight. I was, I was noticing I was doing too much and was kind of getting bogged down, and um, – as we all know, if you were to get eight gigs from Apple, it's going to cost you about 200 bucks. So I started looking at pricing and on Amazon, it's unbelievable how cheap memory prices have gotten for Apple products. Uh, I, that was the one that I purchased and I'm going to switch over to it right now. It's a uh, Kingston technology, eight gig kit. So it was two, four gigs, uh, two, four gig modules uh, for $37. I mean, that's really cheap compared to 
what you know apple's charging you for the same exact thing pretty much uh and you could shop around uh new egg has it but the one that i picked is on amazon and it was 37 bucks came with prime shipping i got it the next day and i popped it in it was a simple install and it was great um you could also put this on the iMac, so it's not just for MacBooks. It's for MacBooks and iMacs. Uh, it's a, it's just the same thing. I mean, it's exactly what you're getting from the manufacturer, but uh, at a fraction of the cost. So for 37 bucks, 8 gigs, not bad. I don't know about you, Michael. Have you updated the memory on your uh, MacBooks? Uh, that's another thing. I have a Retina Display MacBook Pro, so there's no upgrading. Oh, the no upgrade for you. Can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm one of the last ones. So I have the um, the 2011, late 2011 model of the MacBook Pro, and I could I could just do the update. I'd stick with that. I also recommend if you want to spend a little more, and just for customer service, Kingston, I'm not sure about. I'm sure they're fine. Uh, MacSales.com has great memory. It's pretty affordable. It's a lot less than Apple's. It's not it's not it's not hard to be less than Apple's memory. Yeah, uh, and their their customer service is, is second to none. Yeah, and I so mean, you could look around. I mean, they have they have other brands too. Nothing and, is cheaper than what you found, though. Nothing. Thirty seven bucks for that? That's crazy. Yeah, the list price is ninety bucks, and you're saving fifty two dollars, so it's about fifty eight percent of a savings. I just on lost this. you. Muted. Oh, am I muted? <laughs> you lost audio too. John lost audio too. Everybody lost audio. Hello, hello. How about now? No, yeah. There you are. Thank that was you. weird, John. There you go. What the hell happened? Skype. I don't know. <laughs> my, uh, my, my, I guess my Axia just acted up. It just killed the audio. There we go. So that was my pick of the week. And uh, that's it, guys. Uh, Michael Manna, thank you so much for coming on T4 Show once again. Uh, you do a show with uh, Colm. He's a regular in our chat room. He, yeah. um, you haven't banned him yet. No, no. I, I, I will one day, though. He, he, he'll get banned. Uh, right. you and come do an awesome show uh, T4 show that we also syndicate here on the GFQ but go to t4show.com get more information Michael is doing a whole bunch of appearances if you want to book them uh, for any kind of appearance on your radio show on your TV show talk about technology uh, where can people reach you or uh, who can they reach to uh, have you on their show uh, they can go to mediaproductions.tv and there's a contact uh, form there and they, there's other people like DDP uh, and a bunch of other people. So it's not just me for the tech stuff. If you want people in all categories, you go to mediaproductions.tv, contact them, they'll be able to book the talent for you. Awesome. And John, where can people find you? Uh, you can check out my music blog, Amadeus. It's spelled A-M-A-D-A-I-S dot com. And uh, basically, I go to YouTube. I find a bunch of people that cover songs that are really awesome. Um, you might not necessarily know them because they aren't mainstream. So, like, how would you know about them? I find them, I pick them, I handpick them, and I put them on my website for everybody to check out. And, of course, people can follow you on Twitter at Suncast. Uh, yep. I'm Andrew Zarian on Twitter. I'm Andrew Zarian on Twitter. You can follow me there. Uh, Michael Mana is also on Twitter at Michael Mana. Uh, a lot of posts. We were we're all tweeting away every day. Old old seconds of the day. You can see pictures of Michael's cat on Twitter. <laughs> Just for that alone, follow Michael. Uh, and that's it, guys. If you miss any portion of the show, go to our website, guysfromqueens.com. You could download it there. You can subscribe to us. We're on iTunes. We're on uh, the Windows Marketplace. Pretty much anywhere podcasts are available. And uh, that's it for this week, guys. So see you next week on Tech News Weekly. On Tech News Weekly.